Welcome back to another episode of Talk 3D. My name is Ken and I'll be your host. Today I have with me Ben Sheehan from Ahead Simulations and he's brought with us Carl. So Ben, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Uh, so let's start with you, you know, who you are and who you represent and who Carl is. Okay, so I'm Ben, I represent Ahead Simulations. Um, I'm the head of product there. So it is my job to design our new products, improve our current ones and produce them. And what does Ahead Simulations do? We make uh, audiological training mannequins. So if you're an audiologist, you treat and diagnose hearing issues. Uh, and it's not always safe or efficient or effective to practice your skills on like a real live person. Mm -hmm. So we make mannequins that you practice on. Same way, if you've ever taken a CPR course, you have a mannequin that you practice CPR on. All of the audiological skills that you need in clinic, uh, you can practice on Carl. That's a very, very niche and specialized industry. Yes. You know, I'm going to ask you, you know, how you got into this in the first place. Um, okay. So tell us a little bit about, more about your history and the company's history, how Carl came to be. Uh, maybe we'll get to Carl in a bit, but sure. how did you guys come up with the concept in the first place? Uh, I did not come up with the concept. Uh, my founder, who is much smarter and more visionary than I am, came up with the concept. He was doing his master's in biomedical engineering at Western. Mm -hmm. And this was actually his thesis project. So he was speaking with someone from the School of Audiology there. They have a world-renowned school called the National Center for Audiology. Okay. Um, and they needed, they needed a way to practice this procedure called an RECD. So okay. it's a real ear to coupler difference. Okay. And essentially what that is, is um, figuring out what sort of audio level you have in your ear okay. and how that differs from what sort of the baseline level might be of like a hearing aid. And it's gotcha. really important that you get that right because um, you know, you want your hearing aids to actually represent, you know, what the real world sounds like. Makes sense. Uh, and there was no really good way to practice that without getting a volunteer to do it. Um, and sometimes that can be a little bit tricky, especially if something were to go wrong. Uh, you could potentially hurt someone. And, you know, it's hard to find people who want to just stand around and have things shoved into their ears. For sure. Um, so <laughs> Rob, my founder, uh, created a mannequin. And it's, you know, significantly lower fidelity than this one. Um, but for the specific task at the time, you know, I got the job done and it was effective in, in training people how to do that procedure. And from there, he got a grant to further develop this mannequin. And from the grant, he started a company and he started selling them and we've just been continuously improving them ever since. Amazing. Yeah. So, you know, you started about, you said four years ago, four or five years ago? Yeah, the company started four years ago. Okay. I believe the first mannequin was created five years ago. Okay. So, a year so if I were to look back around that time, you know, even for us, five years ago seemed like a yeah. long time ago. Yes. We didn't have all of this technology behind us right now. We had some of it, yeah. but not all of it. Uh, what was it like creating the first iterations and, you know, how many iterations did you go through before we got to basically this Carl? Yeah, I, so I was not there for the first iterations. Um, Rob was the one doing that. Uh, I believe it was significantly harder to create the first iterations uh, because sort of the infrastructure wasn't there. Right. So the first, the very, very first one was not even 3D printed. It was just like a, like a, a CNC foam cutout right. of, believe it or not, a Frankenstein head. Okay. Because I believe he created it around Halloween time. Okay. And then he hollowed it out by hand and, you know, hand poured like a silicone ear. Yeah. And put that in there with like a camera pointing to it so okay. you could see inside the ear. Um, while you were practicing your procedure. Still a great proof of concept though. Yeah, and it was. And then from there, I think he got a Lulz bot. Okay. Uh, who I believe are now defunct. Um, and he started printing them in sort of a lower quality material in PLA. Yeah. Um, and then people still wanted to buy it, even though it may have not been as refined as it is now. Yeah. And so he knew that if someone's willing to buy a product uh, that might have been a little rough around the edges at the time, then if he pursued it further, uh, there could definitely be something there, and I think he was right. For sure, I think the the need definitely speaks for itself that people were seeking that out, yeah, uh, even in, in the prototyping stages of that. So let's talk about you know this Carl, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know how, what is Carl constructed of, uh, and you know tell us a little bit, a little bit about um, you know what kind of features Carl has, sure. you know, to suit the clinical needs. So Carl is almost entirely three D printed. You'll notice there's some hardware there that obviously is not the sticker, but the entire face, the cap, is 3D printed, as well as these ear covers here. And then the ears are poured from silicone, right. um, but we 3D print the molds for those. Okay. So almost everything is 3D printed or one step removed from yeah. 3D printing. Uh, he's made out of ABS, which I know you're familiar with it, but the viewer might not be, um, which is like a pretty high-grade engineering plastic. Yep. Uh, so he's extremely durable. 
And some of the main features he has is that his ears are anatomically and acoustically and aesthetically accurate. So they're very close to the real thing and you can do I, um, almost everything you can do on a real person, you can do on Carl. Amazing. I mean, the finish for Carl looks absolutely stunning. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't tell that it was 3D printed. Uh, how did you get this finish? And, you know, how did you create some of the different uh, parts uh, that are functional, such as, you know, joints and also uh, the hinge in the back uh, and the slots for the USB and the electronics that go inside? Yeah, so for the finishing, um we contract out to auto body shops. Okay. So they so we get them the like rough printed model. Yep. They do all the sanding and like uh, finishing of the surface, and they paint it with really high quality automotive paint. So uh, it's an extremely durable finish. There are a few scuffs on this guy, but he's a demo model. Yeah. Uh, and he's been kicked around a little bit. Like that we're looks having, amazing. We literally cannot keep these guys on the shelves right yeah. now. Uh, so they are selling quickly. Uh, and then you know some of the other features. Uh, I don't know, you would just make them how you would any other feature. You know, we know the size of the hardware and what we want it to do. And 3D printing is pretty flexible with its geometries that, you know, are possible in a part. Sure. So there's really nothing you can't do. Um, so, you know, with any shape at any size, it's pretty easy to add any of the hardware that you want, right? For sure. So in terms of features, let's talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that. I see that, you know, the ears you can remove and kind of replace yep. uh, with different types of ears. Uh, you know, we can open up the head and you can put electronics inside. Yes. You know, what features are usually present in a, a model that's going to a customer uh, and why would they choose those features? Like, so we have three models of Carl. Uh, we have this base model, which is just the face and the ears. Okay. Uh, and with that, you can really practice anything that you would practice on a normal person. Mm -hmm. uh, we have different ear anatomies as well. Your ear canal uh, has a lot of variance with it from person to person. Right. We have a lot of different shapes of ears that we sell because it'll change how you actually like implement your practice. Uh, and then we have different materials of ear as well. There's a very common procedure that you would do uh, in a clinic setting where you take uh, like a mold of someone's ear canal so you can create uh, custom fitted earplugs or hearing aids. Gotcha. Um, but you do that with silicone and these ears are made of silicone. So if you were to do it on these ears without any prepping of the surface, the silicone would co like chemically bond right. to the silicone of the ears. So we sell ears that are made of polyurethane as well. Okay. So you don't have to do anything to them. You can just mold them as you would. I guess uh, that's like why you can ear. have that interchangeable, yeah. you know, depending on what the needs are for that customer. Absolutely. Uh, so that's the base model Carl. We right. have a camera Carl which has a camera embedded inside his face there. Right. And has trans, or not translucent, but transparent ear canals. So the camera is pointing at the ear canal and you can actually see what you're doing internal to the canal while you're cool. practicing. Yeah. So it's very important for uh, one procedure where you basically have to place like a glass tube near the ear canal so you can get uh, the acoustic reading of what is happening directly at the ear canal, okay. which is what you actually hear. Right. Um, so you're basically measuring how like the actual patient's hearing when you do that. Uh, and it's really important that you kind of see what's going on when you're doing that, at least when you're practicing, because the ear canal is a very sensitive organ within the body. For sure. Uh, and you can do damage if, you know, you were to mess up catastrophically. Yeah, so. and I was going to say, like, is that a, a dangerous procedure that most students should be doing, or is that part of, like, the training for a certification? Yeah, it's not dangerous in the sense that, you know, it's like 50% chance of, like, like catastrophe. Right. Uh, but when you're doing it with thousands of students, you know, across North America or across the world every year, you know, there's just opportunities for things to go wrong. Yeah. So, uh, you know, anywhere where we can make improvements in the training process, we think is valuable. Yeah, sounds good. So what are these holes in the side of the cheek for? Uh, that is for the camera, Carl, which uh, is not this model, but we okay. can show you photos of that. Basically, there is a base plate that goes inside the face, okay. and that is how we secure it. Um, bolts run through the face there and are kind of hidden below the surface and they screw into the base plate inside of Carl. Gotcha. That's, and that's where the camera will sit and point at the ear canal. When awesome. You're practicing. So you keep all of those electronics kind of on the inside as well, and there would be a light to light up the, the ear canal. Yep. He is a self-contained package. Okay. So you just need to plug him in and start practicing. Yeah, and he just plugs in by the USB in the back. Yes, sir. And it's all power and, and functions from there. Yep. That's amazing. Yeah. So when you do that, uh, when you have camera Carl and you're doing mm -hmm. your procedure on that, does it kind of look like, you know, uh, what we see on TV when they do surgeries by remote, like where you kind of like see it go through and... Eh, kind of. Okay. Not, not as much because it's, uh, you know, you don't actually have a clear canal and there are other things in your skull. Right. Notably your brain. Right. Um, so 
it's maybe <laughs> yeah, a <laughs> that's true. It's, it's maybe a cleaner image than you might see yeah. in a surgery. But it's representative, you know. It yeah, gives it's them a very good of, idea of what of they're actual, doing from the outside. Yeah, right? it's representative of an actual human anatomy awesome. and what would happen internal to your canal. But we've kind of pared down sort of the things that are extraneous and maybe not so important to the student. For sure. So you know, we talked about iterating and using three D printing as part of the technology, mm -hmm. you know, to create Carl. Um, if we go back a little bit, you know, we talked about you know a lot of iterations to get here. Uh, what uh, technology you know has enabled you to do this, and and what technologies have come up in the past couple of years that has made your life easier in making Carl and revising Carl and, and making him you know the current model as he is. Yeah, I think really you know FTM printing is kind of the basis of this company. Sure. Um, you know, it's a high value product with relatively low volumes. Right. So if we start looking at sort of traditional manufacturing, um, we didn't really have the capital to invest to create tooling to sort of create this mannequin shape for right. the volumes that we do, at least not profitably. Yeah. Um, whereas with something like 3D printing, you know, our unit costs are pretty low from the start and we can continuously iterate it through, you know, from print to print and constantly be improving Carl which is especially important you know, for a startup with a new product, right? Yeah. There's a lot to improve always, and we're always looking to do that. So you know, sometimes from one Carl to the next, from print to print, we're making improvements to the model, which would not be possible with traditional manufacturing. For right? sure. So really, yeah, this, this company and this product would not be possible without the technology that we have here. Yeah, so you guys are constantly improving it you know, all the time, making small changes. Uh, Absolutely. Because yeah, I guess the volumes are low enough where you don't have to label everything a different version. Uh, always going through. Uh, but, you know, tell me a little bit about the ears because, you know, I love the way they look. I love mm -hmm. the way they feel. They're, they look super accurate. You know, how, they are super how, accurate. how do you get that? So these first ears um, were created from a cadaveric scan. Okay. So uh, my boss basically took CT scans of cadavers and took their ear canals right. and found kind of an average canal or like a representative canal of what, you know, a, a typical canal might look like. And from there, he created the 3D model for it. And then what we do is we take that 3D model, print it in the negative uh, as a mold. Right. And then we mold, uh, like we fill the mold with silicone that's been pigmented to look like you know, a flesh tone. Amazing. I mean, yeah, it looks like it, it looks and feels just like the, a real ear. And I'm sure the canal is even more accurate. Going yeah, through. well, you know, silicone has a long history of being used in special effects. Yeah. So there's a lot of products out there that are meant to mimic, you know, human anatomies. Right. So we're very fortunate in that sense. So there's already this very well established, like, ecosystem of products to recreate sort of, you know, humans. Yeah. Um, and as well, you know, they're very accurate anatomically and aesthetically but acoustically as well. So if you were to start measuring the acoustic properties of this ear, right. uh, they're very close to what you would get in wow. a typical human ear. Amazing. So we've talked about you know, the clinical use for Carl, mm -hmm. uh, but what other industries would potentially use your mannequin uh, and, and what types of uses are they are, are deploying in the field? Uh, we sell to a lot of hearing aid manufacturers as well. Um, because these are acoustically accurate, you can put a hearing aid in here and actually see how that would impact a patient's you know, acoustic experience. Right. Um, we sell to clinicians, as we covered, we sell to a lot of uh, training programs. So I think we're in 60 programs around the world okay. that teach uh, audiology students how to become audiologists. Right. And beyond that, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, yeah. plans for world domination type stuff. We're hoping we can start to really get in front of patients uh, and get in front of, uh, get in front of customers. Uh, the big news coming out of the States now is that hearing aids are starting to be uh, sold over the counter. Okay. Um, you know, the same way you might have reading glasses to like a full prescription set of glasses. Right. You can have an over the counter hearing aid to kind of a more uh, sort of clinical one. Yeah. And so the dream for us would be being able to use Carl in that over the counter space and really educate, you know, sort of the layman about for sure. hearing issues and how to, you know, properly select a hearing yeah, aid. Yeah, I've seen some like DIY kits where you can kind of mold your own ear and get your own, not hearing aids, but like, uh, uh, IEMs, you know, uh, headphones and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, is that something that uh, this would be a good model to represent how you would do that? Yeah, I think you could absolutely train pretty much anyone on how to do that with this mannequin. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, the hearing industry in general, and I think hearing as a whole is kind of kind of have its big come up in the next decade or two. Yeah, I think people are starting to recognize its importance, uh, you know, just as a market of health and sort of all the sort of downstream effects that 
poor hearing can have. Right. Um, the World Health Organization recently released their report on rural hearing. One and a half billion people across the globe have some form of hearing loss. Wow. 400 million of them have a moderate to severe hearing loss. Right. Uh, and it costs the world about one trillion dollars a year. Okay. Just from, from the downstream effects of this, not to right. mention, you know, the personal effects that right. having poor hearing can have, right. uh, you know, like socially, developmentally, cognitively. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's an important industry to be in and really any sort of aspect that we can do to help, to, you know, help ultimately patient outcomes at the end of the day, uh, we would love to explore. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I definitely don't think we talk enough, enough about hearing health uh, moving forward. Now, you know, a couple of years down the line when you do begin to dominate the world, yes. uh, obviously, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about scale. Yep. Um, you know, right now you're still producing this mostly in-house. Yes. Um, you know, what would be the next step, you know, if you were to double or triple your, your volumes and what would be the next step if you 50x your volume? Yes. Can, so, we, can we imagine that? Yes, I can. Yeah. Actually, I spend a lot of time thinking about it. Good. Uh, and it does stress me out a little bit. Okay. Because... We do 3D print everything right now. Right. 3D printing is a wonderful technology and has enabled us to grow this company. Uh, but 3D printing is really just a tool in the toolbox uh, and it can't do everything. It's not a panacea, right. right? So if we were to 50X our volumes, unfortunately, I think we would have to move away from 3D printing right. and move towards those more traditional manufacturing methods. Yeah. Just because, you know, and we can cut in this graph later, but you know, the typical graph that we yep. all see about like the unit cost per or the cost per part for like traditional manufacturing, you know, you spend a hundred thousand dollars on like an injection mold. And then as you build parts, you just, the cost per part decreases exactly. yeah. exponentially. Uh, with 3D printing, it is a flat line where, you know, your cost per part stays the same no matter how many parts you produce, right? right. Uh, so to actually truly achieve scale and, you know, have Carl's in every store on every block across yeah. the world, uh, unfortunately, we would need to move away from 3D printing. For sure. Or 3D printing would have to have some drastic changes, which is really exactly. not beyond the realm of possibility. These technologies move extremely quickly. You know, That's you've seen the, it over exactly, you know, five yeah. or six years, and I've seen it. I've been with the company for two years, and I'm shocked at how quickly the industry moves. Yeah. Um, so if I had a crystal orb, I could tell you exactly what we would do, uh, but those are just my best guesses. For right, now. for sure. So eventually, you know, we'll see some kind of injection molding, uh, you know, come into play maybe, and, and, and then also, but would certain elements make sense to still 3D print if they were to be, you know, specifically customizable, for example? Like if someone says, I want my own ear on there, mm -hmm. uh, you know, would that still make sense to have some part of 3D printing or eventually we'll kind of move away from that? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, even just because we built the company around this additive technology, yeah. Um, we've kind of built the model and all the features and sort of all of our product line around additive manufacturing. Yeah. So we've kind of, to borrow like a term from software, we've kind of created a tech debt for ourselves almost right. already, where all of our geometries and sort of processes are set up for additive manufacturing. Um, so even like the, the shift to more traditional manufacturing technologies isn't quite so simple as like a turnkey solution. Right. Um, but yes, to answer your question, I do think there will always be a place for additive manufacturing uh, within the company, just because, you know, when, we're talk when we start talking about people, we're so individual and there's so many different weird quirks that we all have. Yeah. And some, some of our customers are gonna want, you know, a specific ear anatomies to practice a specific thing on. Yeah. Um, and really the only way we can do that sort of economically would be to have 3D printing. Yeah, well, that, that's good. I mean, you'll, you'll have that, you know, scale and you'll also have some ability to continue with customization. Uh, and also, I think that when you guys were designing Carl, mm -hmm. you know, you talked to me about how quickly you guys were iterating. Uh, and that's, you know, a capability that we're getting from additive manufacturing. Tell me a little bit about, you know, uh, how easy it is for your team uh, to keep iterating, making changes, you know, putting ideas in, trying it out, and then, you know, seeing if it works and then, you know, refining that. Uh, shockingly easy. Okay. Um, it is kind of... You don't even think about it. <laughs> I don't even think about it. Um, like, I've had days where, you know, we're testing a new feature or something and I'll print 10 iterations in a day. And right. at the start of the day, I didn't really know what it was gonna look like. And at the end of the day, I have a finalized feature with all the dimensions and all the print settings that we want. Right. Um, it's cheap, it's fast, it's easy. It's kind of really the only way we do things. Is that a huge um, competitive advantage for your company versus any other? Well, I can't else speak there? to the workflows of other companies, but right. I do think uh, that it really helps us shine in the marketplace because right. right. we're able to respond extremely, extremely quickly to marketplace yeah. demands. Uh, we used to make this product called NED. Okay. So nasal pharyngeal education device. Okay. Um, and it would teach nurses how to give a COVID swab okay. uh, properly. 
Yeah. And we were able, we went from a concept to like beta testing in the field with like, actual, you know, COVID testing centers run by public health units, yeah. I think within two months. Wow. And, we, and then we started amazing. a study um, with one of our research partners at St. Joe's Hospital in London. Yeah. Within, yeah, within two months of, of conceptual design. So that's can breakneck move. speed. It is very quick. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, but you guys all came from that industry. You guys all came from, sorry, having the experience of additive, right? Yeah. So you probably don't think that's as crazy as more traditional firms who are, you know, doing everything from injection molding and so forth. They're probably moving much slower and thinking they're moving fast, you know, compared yeah. to how fast you guys are zooming by. Yeah, that's probably true. Uh, and, but I am aware of how quick that is. Okay. I've worked at some other places that did not move as quickly for very good reasons, but right. uh, they did not move as fast. So it is, you know, it's a, it's a fun environment to work in. Because so that's a very affirmative, uh, competitive yeah. advantage. So we talked about how 3D printing has enabled you guys to mm -hmm. make Carl and breakneck speeds, but what have you not liked about additive manufacturing? Let's talk about some mm. downsides, you know, in the road to get here. You know, what are some realistic things that people should think about when they deploy so much additive, additive manufacturing technology, you know, at their workplace? Yeah, I think it depends on, you know, what you're deploying it for. Um, for like an end use product that'll get into a consumer's hands, um, there is a little bit of a connotation with having something 3D printed. Right. A lot of people, and especially a lot of our customers think it's really cool. Yeah. And it's kind of, you know, really nice. Uh, but if you were to just hand them the raw 3D printed part without post-processing, they would kind of maybe uh, scrunch their face up a little bit and wonder why it looks kind right. of unfinished. Um, so I guess post-processing is kind of the last really big hurdle I see yeah. um, that's kind of stopping you know 3D printing from being this uh, kind of cradle-to-grave solution for a product. Right. Because you know, if, if we're printing something, it's like, hey, I draw it up in CAD, I send it to the printer and everything magically automatically gets made. Yep. And then to post-process it, you have to sand it for a few hours and then yep. paint it. So we go from, you know, 21st century. And you have to be century, an expert at that too. Yeah, right? and we go from 21st century to like 15th century and we're still in the same, you know, production chain, right? Yeah. So I think to kind of close the loop and make everything uh, really automated and kind of, you know, carry the promise of 3D printing all the way through the supply chain, to me, it seems like post-processing is, is a big hurdle. Right. And, you know, there are companies that are starting to work on this and seem to be having success, but it hasn't really had the wide stream adoption uh, that you know 3D printing has. For sure. So let's talk about you know technologies more specifically because mm -hmm. you know over here we have FDM, we have uh, SLA, and we have SLS, uh, and you use at least two of those processes yep. uh, in creating Carl. Uh, what would you like to see in the next couple of years, uh, progression-wise, technology-wise? Mm -hmm so that it makes your life easier and it'll help you scale more and it'll just maybe even change the way you guys do things. What is, what, what's on your wish list? What is on my wish list? Yeah. Things that don't need to be post-processed. Okay. Um, that's just kind of a big pain point for us. Right. Um, I would kind of like to see SLS, you know, obviously the Form 3L has come out. Yep. Uh, and that's a large step forward in terms of format, uh, like in terms of format size. Yeah. I'd like to see it go even bigger. Uh, you know, at the scale that we're working at, the human scale, yeah. we're still a little bit outside the capabilities of current SLS uh, products. Other than that, I'm not really sure. I think, you know, I think it's just adding more materials, adding more capability, getting things faster, more repeatable. Yeah. Faster cheaper. FDM speeds, right? Yeah. yeah. Cheaper. Because, um, you know, if we're talking about that, go back to that graph of the, you know, price per unit. Uh, if we can bring that flat line lower, then 3D printing becomes even more competitive again, right? For sure. And, and cheaper in, in capital costs as well. You know, maybe less of a hurdle for us, we're more of an established company. Yeah. But I think one of the really big strengths of 3D printing is we can kind of democratize, you know, production. Yeah. It doesn't have to be this huge capital cost that you need, you know, millions of dollars behind you to, to create a product. For sure. Um, so if we can just get higher quality things at lower prices, I think, we'd be really amazed at the things people could come up with. Do you think we'll ever reach a stage where, you know, the technology is so easy, so accessible, so Starcraft cheap? replicator type thing? Well, not, not that, <laughs> but if there was, everybody had access to it, yeah. you could just order this and a whole bunch of people might send you the parts and they're all as good as you expect. Would we ever read that crowdsource stage where, you know, the parts coming out of consumer printers, prosumer printers aren't that good where you'd be like, yeah, acceptable, acceptable, acceptable. Yeah, probably. Yeah, you I think, think we'll so? There. I don't know how quickly it's going to happen. 
and I, don't, I think most people still won't care. You know, <laughs> guys like us, we're probably a little nerdier, a little more technically, technologically Definitely. inclined, and we really like this sort of thing. Yeah. I don't think everyone does, um, but I really don't think, you know, in 10 years, there, there's a reason if you were inclined and you wanted to, that you couldn't, you know, learn a CAD software in a day and, you know, create your own kitchen utensils or whatever you wanted to do, yeah. right? Being such an avant-garde company, starting printing, you know, doing things, you know, daily iterations, mm -hmm. is it hard for you to find staff, you know, and train them to, to work with this technology? Not really. Um, I think, you know, we're probably a younger company as well, so we tend to skew younger in our hiring. Yeah. I think, you know, the target demos that we're looking at for, for hiring, uh, like this technology, a lot of them have used it before and they're familiar with it. They've either used it personally yeah. or in class projects um, because it's starting to become really, really accessible. And I think people are excited by it. So even if they don't have that experience, they're you know ready, willing, and able to learn it. Yeah, they're not scared of the technology anymore. Not at all. They're like, yeah, I'll have to learn the particulars of this machine or this machine, but uh, I grasp the concepts, right? Absolutely, yeah. Amazing. So what's next for Carl? I mean, can you tell us, you know, you know, what might be ahead or does, you don't have to have any spoilers, but you know, what's next for Carl? Um, well, you may have noticed Carl has a very large head. He is in the 99.9th percentile okay. of head circumferences. Um, so we're probably going to bring him more in line to, you know, human norms and human averages. Uh, you might notice you have to screw in the ears right now. That can be kind of a cumbersome process. You know, especially we have four, five, six, we're trying to come out with more ear anatomies. Right. And we want someone to be able to practice all of them quickly. Uh, so we're coming up with ways to kind of reduce the friction there. Um, and as well, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say about this, but we're trying to give Carl hearing. Um, okay. So very soon, uh, Carl will have microphones embedded within him. Amazing. And he will be able to program a hearing loss into Carl and okay. then test his hearing as you would wow. a normal patient. That's awesome. That, that's really functional. Yeah, so we really do think this is just the beginning. Um, we kind of say this saying internally, we're selling the sandbox. So we're just selling, you know, the tool that you can use um, to kind of practice your own skills and come up with your own practices if you want to use it, right. use the tool for. Um, so we're just trying to build a bigger and better sandbox every day. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if I asked you this, but, you know, what types of different ears do you have and why would there be the differences between them? <laughs> So we have three ear anatomies and we're working on two more currently. Uh, so we have a large anatomy, which is kind of, which refers to the size of the ear canal. Um, so a large is kind of maybe your average size ear canal, maybe like a one standard deviation above okay. uh, in terms of sort of diameter. We have a small one, which is the opposite. Right. It's probably a standard deviation below. And then we have one called the bendy ear anatomy, which uh, probably a, a small portion of the population, probably 15, 20%. Kind of have like this right angle turn within okay. the ear canal, yeah. uh, which can make it a little difficult to practice on. Right. Um, so we try to have a range of anatomies so that you know, students and clinicians and researchers can be exposed to kind of the breadth of, of you know, human anatomies when they're you know, practicing their craft. Is there any like regulatory hurdles to jump through because you're no, 3D printing God. versus not 3D printing? No, there's nothing with 3D printing. Um, yeah, no, there's, there's nothing related to 3D printing in terms of regulatory hurdles. That's good. And it's also, we make very, we, we work very hard to make sure this is not a medical device. Right. It is just a medical simulation device. Right. Um, because, you know, the FDA and Health Canada, those guys are sticklers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For good reason. It makes but a lot of it, sense. It does, you know, we're talking about trying to move fast and iterate continuously. And uh, that is maybe sort of not the, uh, like, culture of those organizations. Right. So let's talk a little bit about you, uh, okay. maybe how you started with the head, uh, and, and kind of uh, you know your thoughts on what happened in the past couple of years, and how fast things are moving. Yeah, so I started with the head. Um, believe it or not, my neighbor worked, uh, formerly worked at the head, um, and he was telling me about an open position they had, and this was in May of 2020. Okay. So I had been furloughed from my previous position. Um, so it kind of came up at the right time. So what was your experience before that? Uh, I had worked, uh, I'd done a few co-ops in automotive manufacturing, uh, some medical device manufacturing, and then I was going to work. Um, so you had the perfect and, experience for this. I did, yeah, <laughs> kind of actually. So it was a good blend of, you know, there, there is a lot to be learned from traditional manufacturing. Yeah. There are a lot of really good practices there. For sure. Um, but I think I was able to translate that well into sort of a new technology and kind of a new paradigm of 
of creating things, right? Right. So, you know, is that some of the skills that you took from automotive manufacturing in terms of having Carl finish, you know, this nicely? Because, you know, whenever I look at Carl, I'm, I'm amazed because, you know, the light on him, uh, the smoothness, and, and all the parts that fit together, you know, such great fit and finish, especially for 3D printed parts. And mm -hmm. that's something that people out there sometimes don't think that they can get to this, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like almost finalized product, not almost finalized, but like, a finished product where people don't even think that it's 3D printed. You know, yeah. how, how did you get from, you know, uh, a rough FDM print to this? Uh, and, and what was that process for you to learn how to get there to here? Was that quick or? It, what, it was, you know, it wasn't too challenging. It was mostly just speaking, you know, to people who do, who do have the skill set. Right. You know, who do know how to prep a surface and, you know, select proper paints and apply them properly and have all the equipment to do that. And basically just talking to people and seeing who was interested. Right. And then eventually we found a few partners that wanted to work with us. Right. And as you can see, they've done a really good job. Amazing. Uh, so other than Carl, you know, are we going to expect any other models uh, from ahead? Uh, yeah. So I've talked about base Carl and camera Carl. Yes. We also have baby Carl. Okay. Who uh, is a pediatric audiology patient simulator. Um, so uh, baby ears are basically different than fully grown adult ears. Okay. And you know, baby faces are different as well. And it's a different experience and sort of, you know, an adjacent skill set, but also slightly different than practicing on adults. So for that specific niche, we create their own simulator for Makes pediatric Makes a lot audiology. of sense. Cause yeah. you know what? I mean, I just got a baby, so they don't sit still for a moment. Yes. How do you practice, right? How do yeah. you practice getting it right <laughs> if, if they're just like ah, all over the place? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a skill set that I don't have personally, but I'm very glad there are people out there who do. Yeah, well, you make the aid for them to train <laughs> on that. So I think it's a good time for us to wrap up. Sure. Um, so let's, uh, let's quickly you know, tell our audience who you are uh, again, okay. um, what you do, and where they can find Carl. Yeah, so I'm Ben Sheehan. I'm the head of product at Ahead Simulations. Um, I design the products and design how we produce them. And if you're interested in knowing more about Carl or our story or about audiology in general, you can go to ahedsimulations.com. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you.